attending today. My name is Carrie Fisher Stone, and I am the uh, Deputy Executive Director for California's ABLE program, CalABLE. Um, we have been up and running now a little bit over two months. I guess we're actually in month three. We launched in December, the end of December 2018, and I know many have been long awaiting um, this very important program. Um, what I will do today is sort of give some background on ABLE accounts in general, uh, the ABLE law, how these accounts work, um, and then I'll go into specifics about the Cal ABLE program. Um, I do believe we'll have some time for questions at the end, hopefully, Trudy. Yes, I believe we will. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so the slide that says ABLE Act of 2014. Uh, the Federal ABLE Act was signed by President, o President Obama in 2014, and what this federal law did um, was specifically add a section to what we call 529 um, code in IRS. So without getting too technical, um, these programs, ABLE programs, were modeled after college savings programs. So a lot of us are already familiar with 529 college savings programs here in California. Uh, for instance, that program is Scholar Share. And the accounts have the same sort of design. The idea was that individual states could create these uh, tax advantaged savings and investment accounts uh, for individuals to um, save tax advantagely when they are spending their money on a qualified expense. So, in the case of college savings, we understand that those qualified expenses are educational expenses. In the case of ABLE, those are something that we call qualified disability expenses. Um, this legislation was the result of about 10 years of advocacy um, from predominantly families of children with developmental disabilities, um, those in the autism um, space, Down syndrome, and uh, it really arose from the idea that their children uh, should have the ability to have a semblance of economic self-sufficiency, um, just like their typical children, um, and, and have that right to save money and spend like we all do. They really saw it as an equity issue. Um, but the, the main advantage with these programs was that for the first time, we could actually save money and protect our eligibility for means-tested public benefit programs. That's federal, state, and local means-tested benefit programs. So you, we're talking about SSI, Medicaid, SNAP. Um, and by, by tax advantage, what we mean specifically is that the money in the accounts are safe from federal and state income taxes when they are used to pay for these qualified disability expenses. And I will go into those uh, momentarily. And that includes the interest that you accrue in these accounts. Like I said, these are investment accounts as well as savings accounts. Um, you do have the option to select an investment option and potentially grow your money. And any interest that you earn um, on your investment, that money as well cannot be counted as income. Um, Again, main benefit being that the funds in the ABLE account serve as sort of an asset shield or a resource shield. A lot of us are familiar with the fact that many means-tested programs have a resources or an asset test um, and or an income test. And so what the ABLE accounts are, they're, they're shielded on the asset side or the resource side. They cannot be counted when we're determining eligibility for those means-tested programs. And again, they really have um, the potential to be a game changer for helping people with disabilities really save and invest in a way they never have been able to before. Um, really help create you know, some financial independence for people with disabilities because, um, for instance, these accounts are owned by the individual with the disability. The account owner or beneficiary is the owner um, unlike a trust, uh, a trust where you have a trustee, the ABLE account owner is the beneficiary and the account owner in every case. And this gives them a lot more control and choice over how they can now save and spend their money. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is titled uh, CalABLE or California ABLE Act. 
So as I mentioned, um, the federal law gave individual states the ability to create these accounts. And CalABLE is the name of our program. We um, there's, there's a total, I think, of 42 states operating plans right now. And um, in many of those cases, you know, a California resident would have the ability, um, similar to college savings, to uh, enroll in an out-of-state plan. And so that is an option as well. Um, all of these plans tend to operate the same way um, in the sense of how they're treated, the treatment of the ABLE account itself, but there are minor differences between plans, um, including with fees, with investment options, with different features. Um, so we do tell people, you know, there may be another plan that you'd like to explore, and we don't deter people from doing that. I do encourage people to do some shopping around, and we'll talk a little bit more later about why you might want to pick California's plan potentially over another plan. Um, the California ABLE Act basically mirrored the federal statute, the federal statute, the federal ABLE Act, and it was kept intentionally broad. So this program, because of that, has a lot of flexibility. Um, we are a national program, so just like I said, a California resident could go out of state to open an account, so could um, um, a resident of another state enroll in CalABLE. And that's good for the program. Um, the idea is that we want to build a lot of, um, we want to have a lot of particip participants in the plan for self-sufficiency purposes. Um, the more people we have participating over time, we have the ability to drive down the cost. And so having as many people participate as possible is really beneficial to the plan and its longevity. I'll talk also about the fact, or a little bit about our structure. Um, so we are our own state agency. We are the California ABLE Act Board. Um, we are administered out of the state treasurer's office. The California state treasurer serves as the chair of, our, of a seven member board. And we've been really fortunate, you know, this is something that does distinguish us from some of the other uh, state plans, I think, in that the other uh, representatives on the board do represent the disability community. Um, specifically, we have the, the directors from the agencies that administer means-tested benefit programs and who de uh, deliver disability services. So for instance, Department of Rehabilitation, uh, that director is on our board, State Independent Living Council, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, um, Development, uh, Department of Developmental Services. All of those folks um, are on our board and over the last few years as we've developed the program, they really have been instrumental in making sure that we listen to our constituents and develop a program that is really going to best meet their needs. Um, again, just very different than how some of the other state plans are run, oftentimes just out of their, their treasury department. Um, so we do have their participation, um, which we think is crucial to making sure that this program really um, does serve our constituents as best as possible. And again, as I mentioned, we launched December 18th, 2018. We were a little bit late out of the gate. Um, Nothing to be concerned about with that regard. Um, it was specifically because we needed to um, contract with a third party financial services company, an investment manager, um, who was willing to, to adhere to all of our very strict standard of care in contracting. California has a lot of laws that, that allow for a lot of consumer protection. That's a good thing. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were in contract with a firm who was willing to accept, you know, all of those those terms of liability. So that was truly the delay. And now I do feel we've ended up with a program, um, even though we've had to wait a little bit longer, that is very safe and secure for our participants. <clears throat> okay. The next slide, titled Vision and Mission. Um, I'd like to include this in here because, again, I think it's something that, that distinguishes us a little bit. Um, in coming up with the vision and mission for the board, for the agency, you know, this wasn't something that a couple of staff people came up with in a conference room. While we were waiting to get up to speed um, and launch CalABLE, we took that time. We, we hosted about 200 stakeholder meetings throughout the state where we met with folks and asked them specifically, um, you know, what did they want to see in a program like this? 
Um, myself being a member of the disability community, holy heart, you know, holy believe in um, nothing about us without us. Um, that's been something that we've stuck to. Um, and we've wanted to, again, make sure that, that the people who are using the program have a say. Um, this is a government program. Sometimes there's a lot of distrust around that. We, want to made, we wanted to make sure that they were a part of the process, and that's going to be an ongoing thing. So our vision is to provide greater financial security to Californians living with a disability. And our mission is to meet the diverse needs of our customers and our families. We pledge to be customer driven, accountable, and a trusted partner in providing financial services. And what I would emphasize there is the customer service aspect. Um, if you call us, we answer the phone. We really um, are dedicated to helping people um, get the resources they need as they engage in this program and, and learn how it intersects with their public benefits. Um, and again, emphasizing the trust piece. Again, this is a very brand new program. Um, sometimes we encounter some skepticism around it because it's new and a lot of people have a hard time believing that they can now save above those resource limits and keep their benefits. And so building trust with the community is foremost for us. The next slide talks about our values and this just sort of reiterates what I said previously. Um, you know, transparency is a big one for us. We, throughout the process, have been dedicated to talking about any issues we've encountered as we've launched the program, um, where there are things that need to be fixed or legislation that needs to be pursued to improve the program. We are open to that dialogue. Um, and then I would also emphasize collaboration. Um, just as we're doing today, um, our partners are so crucial folks like uh, Trudy and, and PHP who are willing to um, help us really get the word out about this important program. Um, there's just three of us based in Sacramento. That's our entire agency. Um, and so we have a lot of groups to reach. And to that end, we want to um, collaborate as much as possible with our, our um, stakeholders. Okay, so I'll move on to nuts and bolts. I'll talk a little bit about eligibility. Um, who is eligible for a or an ABLE account? The federal law indicates that the individual must have um, become disabled prior to the age of 26. Um, a couple of things I always say about this. Obviously, it's not popular um, among a lot of folks because it serves to exclude a lot of folks who became disabled you know, after the age of 26. And people say, why was it age 26? Um, it was honestly just an arbitrary number. Again, this was a federal bill. And as, it's, as it made its way through um, congressional approval, um, because it's a tax advantage program, they, you know, the thinking was that if you let everybody with a disability participate in the program, then it was seen as um, a significant loss of tax revenue. So it was related to cost. There is, though, I want to highlight that there's been um, some, some new legislation just recently reintroduced just a few days ago. It's called the ABLE Age Adjustment Act. And we're all really excited about this. All of the different states are because what this would do would increase that age of onset from 26 to 46. And so that would definitely help um, a, a majority of, a lot more people participate in the program. Um, the other thing I mentioned about the age 26, just so folks are clear, is that uh, that is not tied to your diagnosis necessarily. So for instance, especially those who uh, may have a mental health diagnosis, um, somebody might develop schizophrenia say at the age of 30 but it's clear that the person you know that the onset of that disability was before the age of 26. in that case what a person can do is what we call self-certification and that would require going to a doctor it doesn't have to be the doctor you know at the time that you were um, at the at, at the time that you were determined to have the onset it can be any licensed physician who essentially writes a note that says this person has you know x disability and the onset of this disability was prior to the age of 26. Um, we don't collect those doctor's notes um, we ask people to hang on to them however because able accounts can be audited by either the social security administration or the irs 
Um, and in, and if that were to happen, then you would want to be in a position to be able to prove your eligibility. Um, now, assuming you meet that age of onset criteria already, and you also are eligible for or receiving um, SSI or SSDI, you don't need to go through that self-certification piece. You're automatically qualified. Um, now, with regard, again, to self-certification, I'll just mention our enrollment system, when you open a Calable account, is a self-certifying system. Um, so basically, everybody does this. When they open the account, they will check a box that says, um, I certify under penalty of perjury that I meet the eligibility criteria for an ABLE account. And that pretty much does it. Um, again, if you, you need to go through the self-certification um, documentation process, it's just keeping a note in your file. We're not going to be collecting anything. In terms of disabilities, which disabilities um, apply, the language out of the law is based on Social Security's definition, and that's the third bullet point there. It says, um, must have been diagnosed by a qualified physician with a physical or mental disability resulting in marked and severe functional limitations that is expected to last at least one year. And if you're curious about um, some of those diagnoses that would be accepted under that definition, then we would refer you to SSA's um, list of compassionate allowances or their blue book listings, which can easily be found online. So I'll move on now to the slide titled Account Contributions. So as I mentioned, before the ABLE Act, a person with a disability could not save more than $2,000 without impacting their SSI. And um, again, this, this applies to many different means-tested benefit programs, right? Any other uh, resource could potentially be um, counted against you for things like low-income housing, um, any other program that you're participating in. With the ABLE Act, you can actually save now up to $15,000 per year, or I should say contribute. You can contribute up to $15,000 per year because you can also earn interest. So you could potentially save above that $15,000 per year, but you can contribute up to $15,000 per year, and you can save up to $100,000 before your SSI would be impacted. Now, the $100,000 um, threshold applies specifically to SSI benefits. Um, again, it's going to take us some time to get to $100,000 in an account when we have, you know, a contribution limit of about $15,000 per year. Um, but once you did, say you did go over that $100,000 threshold, what would happen is that your SSI benefits would, it, would be suspended at that point. Now, you would not lose eligibility, you would not have to go back through the eligibility process, but the SSI benefits would be, they would go into suspension until you spent below the $100,000. Um, one thing I'll mention also with regard to the 15,000 contribution limit is that um, that that number will, will change from year to year with adjustments in inflation. Um, it's tied to the federal gift tax so for instance, last year, the, the contribution limit was 14,000 per year. This year it's 15,000 per year, likely to see something around 16,000 next year. Um, so that annual contribution limit will, will increase as time goes on. Now in California, you actually can save um, up to a lifetime limit of 529,000 in a Calable account. Again, if you're receiving SSI, you wouldn't want to go over that 100,000 threshold, but assuming SSI is not a factor for you, you could actually save up to 529,000 or more with interest and still have no impact to other means-tested benefit programs, and that includes Medi-Cal, Medicaid. Um, so even, even Medi-Cal that is tied to your SSI, say that you passed, you know, the, the $100,000 threshold, your SSI benefits were suspended, your, your Medi-Cal would continue. Uh, Medi-Cal is exempt from that $100,000 cap. So you can remain on Medicaid and save up to $529,000 in a Calable account. Something to keep in mind when you're looking at other states, different states do have different lifetime limits. 
Um, in California, it's 529,000. It is the highest in the nation. Um, but you'll see in some other plans, um, some some have a lifetime limit of just $100,000 or $300,000. Um, so we do have the higher lifetime limit here in California. Um, we also hear from folks, well, they're worried what happens if I accidentally contribute too much or go over the 100,000 threshold. And um, the system that we use, the enrollment uh, platform that we use, it will automatically reject any excess contributions so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, if you've already contributed 15 for the year and somebody tries to contribute additional, um, the system won't even accept it. It will just kick it back. And as you approach the 100,000 threshold, you will get notifications that you're getting close to that so that you can you know, ensure that you're staying under that limit so that you don't lose SSI. Okay, are we doing okay so far? I think we are. I've got, I'm collecting a list of questions that people will have for after you're done with the presentation. Wonderful, okay. So my next slide is titled Able to Work. And this is related to contributions as well. Um, last year with federal tax reform that passed, um, it had a, a number of favorable provisions included in that for ABLE which was great. And one of these was called able to work. And what this says is that if the account owner or beneficiary is working, if they're employed, they can actually uh, contribute over that $15,000 contribution limit. Um, a couple of things there, they can't be participating in an employer sponsored retirement plan. Um, so if you're participating in a retirement plan that's employer sponsored, unfortunately, you can't take advantage of able to work. If, if your employer um, offers a retirement plan and you opt out, then you're okay. You could, you could still participate in able to work and that would be fine. Now, how much can you contribute over the 15,000? It's whichever is less. It's either an amount equal to your annual gross salary or the federal poverty level for um, that calendar year. So in 2019, the federal poverty level is currently $12,140. So as an example, um, if the beneficiary has a gross annual salary of 11,000 per year, they could contribute from their own earnings up to an additional 11,000 on top of the 15,000. Uh, if they're making more than 12,140, then that would be their cap. And again, those additional contributions over the 15,000 need to come from the beneficiary's earnings. So it doesn't just automatically increase the total contribution amount for everyone who's contributing. It's still 15,000 from all sources. And then the additional um, for the individual who's working out of their own earnings. So there is the potential um, here to, to contribute roughly 27,000 per year if you're working. Okay. The next slide is titled Some Able Basics. Just a couple of things that I like to make people aware of. Um, an eligible individual can only have one ABLE account. We point this out because it's different than college savings where you can actually um, have multiple college savings accounts. With ABLE, you can only have one ABLE account at a time. If you did enroll in another state, uh, you do have the ability to roll your account back over to California if you wish or vice versa. If you have a CaliABLE account, you could also roll out, um, but you would have to close the account um, that you had initially. A uh, second bullet points out again that the beneficiary is the account owner. This is their funds. However, if the beneficiary is a minor, if the beneficiary is unable to or doesn't have capacity to manage their own account, um, if they elect to have someone else manage their account, they can do that. And um, in that case, what needs to happen is that an authorized legal representative would be the person opening, managing, and transacting on the account. <clears throat> now, who is an authorized legal representative? That definition is also laid out in federal law, and currently it's pretty specific. It's either a parent, a legal guardian or conservator, 
or a power of attorney. So the beneficiary has to have one of those individuals um, in order to have an authorized legal representative who can transact on the account on their behalf. Um, third bullet point talks again about the fact that these accounts are asset protected. Okay, so they don't shelter income. And the reason I bring this up is because this is one of the big misconceptions with ABLE. Um, some people think, um, you know, if they have an income source coming in, whether it's earnings, maybe alimony, a pension, um, sometimes they think, well, if I deposit my income directly into the ABLE account, um, then I won't take any penalty for that. They think it can sometimes shelter that income. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Again, these accounts are protected. They're not counted as resources. So, for instance, with social or supplemental security insurance, SSI, um, we know that there's a resource test and there's also an income test. So the income test is still applicable. Um, when you're receiving any kind of income, SSI is going to apply whatever formulas they typically do with regard to income and you know, reduce the benefit or um, you know, suspend benefits um, accordingly. Um, so that still happens. Now, you know, we still encourage people, definitely put, put your money um, into an ABLE account and then you can start to, to grow some savings. But unfortunately, you know, that income test piece will still apply um, regardless of whether the money is going into the ABLE account. Um, these accounts, as I mentioned, they're investment accounts, but they can function just like a typical savings or checking account. And many, are, many people are using them for that purpose. Um, it just really kind of depends on your individual circumstances and goals. Um, in the instance of my son, who does have a Calable account, he's he's 13, and um, you know, rather than open a college savings account for him, I've opened the Able account. I don't know if he will end up going to college or using, you know, or having educational expenses. But if he doesn't, then I can still use the uh, Able account to spend um, on pretty much anything else for him and not have to take any kind of tax penalty like I would have. Um, had I just kept the college savings account. Other people are going to use these more day to day, um, sort of as their transactional checking account. There's a lot of folks who are paying um, basic living expenses out of their ABLE account because that is a qualified expense. Um, so things like food, things like rent, um, housing is a qualified disability expense with ABLE, which leads me into my next slide. Let's talk about what a qualified disability expense is. So what is a qualified disability expense or QDE? These, uh, this definition also comes from the law and the, the first bullet point is straight out of the statute and it basically defines an expense, a qualified disability expense as any expense related to the designated beneficiary as a result of living a life with disabilities that helps maintain or improve your health your independence or your quality of life. So it's a very, very broad definition and intentionally so. The ABLE Act stands for achieving a better life experience. And so the thought is that if the expense helps improve your life experience, it is a qual it's considered a qualified disability expense. Um, the fact sheet which was provided to you as a handout does, does go into some very specific categories. There's a whole host of them. Some of them are mentioned here. Um, again, things like education, housing is a qualified disability expense under ABLE, transportation, healthcare expenses, but there's a lot more um, assistive technology, funeral and burial costs, um, personal assistance. It really kind of goes on and on. Now, so because it's so broad, um, a lot of times folks will ask, well, what is not a qualified disability expense? You know, they're worried about making a purchase that wouldn't meet the criteria. Um, we don't have a guideline for that. We, we only have the language from the law. Um, we ourselves do not track individual expenses, and this goes for other state programs as well. The onus is on the person who's managing the account to make that determination as to whether or not they believe that the expense meets that criteria. What we do tell people is to hang on to receipts um, for 
if possible. Um, we'll also have a prepaid debit card coming soon, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, which would actually produce a statement where you can see, you know, that way you can have sort of a track record of your expenses if you're using the prepaid card. Um, but to keep, keep your receipts in case you're ever audited by the IRS. And the likelihood of that, probably not very high. But again, you would want to be in a position to make a case for why you, you spent the money um, the way you did. Some things that all of, all of the state administrators have agreed are probably not um, qualified disability expenses or things like gambling, alcohol. Um, but again, it's kind of a gray area and, and we really kind of go with the broader, if this helps your situation as it results, as it relates to your disability, it's a qualified expense. Now, the third bullet point points to the fact that you could take a non-qualified disability expense from your account. You can do this in other programs like college savings. Um, it's not illegal, but if you did do that, um, the expense would then become subject to, to a tax penalty, um, to regular income taxes, in fact, and then there would be a tax penalty on the earnings um, related to that expense. So not a huge penalty, but the most important thing to note here is that obviously, if you're not going to spend the funds on a qualified disability expense, then you potentially put your benefits at risk because it could then um, those funds could then be counted as a resource um, by means-tested programs. Okay, my next slide is titled CalABLE Account Withdrawals. This just talks a little bit about how um, money is taken out of the program to pay for expenses. Um, again, we have an online system, so all of the transacting occurs online, and it's very user-friendly. I've been doing this myself. Um, for my son, and so I've, I've got to have some experience with it. Um, essentially, you can do it a couple different ways. You can go into the system and you can um, do an electron electronic transfer of funds or what we call an ACH transfer to a bank account. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I'll go in and I will request a withdrawal and I will then sync up my personal checking account in order to uh, withdraw those funds. You could also have a check um, sent to the beneficiary, to the authorized legal representative, or a third party. So say you wanted to pay your rent out of the account. You could go into the system. You can say, I want to make a withdrawal for you know, $1,100. And then you can, you can do that as a third party um, check payment and have the check directly sent to the third party that way. There is a cost with that. So that is something that I do point out. I think it's $5 per check that you issue. Um, but the other way that we'll be able to withdraw funds, and this is expected to launch before the end of June, is our prepaid debit card. And the prepaid debit card is not your typical ATM card that has you know, direct access to your entire account. It's a loadable card. And so by, by having a loadable card, it does build in some safeguards um, you know, with regard to fraud protection, that sort of thing. Um, and particularly for people who are not used to, you know, getting to spend their own money. So in, in the instance, again, of my son, um, who's becoming a teenager, you know, he wants to go out with friends. I really see the debit card as um, kind of a financial uh, learning tool for him. Um, I can go into, as the authorized legal representative, I can go into his account. I could load a certain amount of money, you know, $30 maybe onto his debit card. And then I could give him the debit card to use and he could take friends to the movies or he could buy himself a coffee. Um, so um, very useful in that sense and, and, and has those protections built in. You can withdraw money at any time. Uh, there's no limit on how many times you can do that. And there's no charges on um, taking money, withdrawing money from the, from the account. Um, with regard to the electronic transfers in particular, again, if you were going to have a check sent out, you would be looking at a charge for doing that. And we do plan to have more details um, rolling out soon about how the prepaid card will work. Um, all of that is in process. We just had a meeting today to learn more about that. We're going to be doing some testing and then we hope to roll it out. Um, the end of June would be the absolute latest. We do hope to have it um, well before then, hopefully. Okay, the next slide, CalABLE features and benefits. Um, what are some reasons you might se select CalABLE over another state? Um, 
we have low fees. So all of the programs throughout the state operate on fees. Um, this is just the cost of running the program. Um, and I'll go into, in, in a few slides, I'll talk, I'll do a breakdown of what our fees break down into. Um, but as an example, one of the main fees that's seen with these accounts is something called an account maintenance fee. That's an annual charge. Um, and the range nationally for that is it's zero. Actually, Tennessee is one state that does not have fees, so they're very lucky in that regard. Um, their legislature gave them an appropriation to basically um, cover the cost of their program. So they're very lucky in that sense. They don't have fees. Um, on, on, they don't have the account fee. Um, they may have some, some investment fees. But the, but the annual uh, account maintenance fee ranges anywhere from zero to $60 per year. And in California, um, our annual fee is $37 per year. That breaks down to a little bit over $3 per month. So that fee is assessed monthly. It comes out of your um, account automatically, and then you see that on your statement. And we'll, again, I'll go into some of the other fees in a moment. Um, our, our process is online. There is no a paper application. Um, the reason for this, you know, some people have wanted to see a paper application and um, the main, first of all, most of the plans are, are doing this electronically. I think there's a handful of plans who do offer a paper application, but with the paper application, you know, anytime you're doing, doing anything in paper, the cost goes up significantly. So one of the reasons that we have an online system is to keep it cheaper for our participants. Um, but, the, but the process itself is very, again, user-friendly. Like I said, I did it myself. It took me about 10 minutes to set up my son's account. We're hearing anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes for somebody to get on um, and go through the process. And it's free to get on and do that. Um, you will, when you open an account, have a minimum contribution to start of $25 to, to open the account. Um, similar to withdrawals, contributions into the account can be made electronically. So again, through an ACH uh, from a bank account, you can also have checks sent to the program. Um, again, money can come from all sources with an ABLE account. So this is one of the great things about ABLE. The person can put their own money in, they can put a benefit payment in, money can come from a, from a trust. Um, but friends can contribute, family members can contribute, anybody can contribute. And so if somebody wants to make a direct contribution to the ABLE account, say by check, they would simply uh, make out a check to CalABLE and they would put the individual's uh, name and account number in the memo and that way they could make a, a direct third party contribution to that person and it's not counted as income when it's a third party contribution. It's gonna go directly into the ABLE account um, in that case, it, it's not counted as income. And the other thing that's great too, is that our system has a feature, we call it e-gifting, where you could actually send out a link from your system to friends and family members and ask them to make contributions to the account. You can create what's called an e-gifting event. So this is similar to um, GoFundMe, which a lot of us are familiar with, other crowd uh, funding mechanisms. Um, you know, say your kiddo's having a birthday, you could send out a link and say, you know, in lieu of gifts, maybe make a donation to my kid's um, ABLE account. Other people have used it to sort of crowd, crowdfund, maybe they're saving for a big expense, like a wheelchair um, or a piece of ass assistive technology. Um, they could send out the link and say, you know, I'm saving for this purpose, can you help contribute to my ABLE account? And so it's just a very easy way for other people to contribute um, you know, quick and easy. On the next slide, I'll talk about our investment options. We have four investment options with the CalABLE plan. Um, again, this is somewhere um, a distinction between us and some other plans. All the plans have a different number of op options. Um, and so if that's something that is important to you. Yes. Um, that is not the next slide for us. Oh, okay. We're seeing protection from Medi-Cal recovery and credit. Got it. No worries, you're correct, that's what I have. <laughs> I wasn't looking ahead. Thank you. I think investment options is coming up and I will go into those momentarily. Okay, let's go on actually to the next slide that does talk about Medi-Cal recovery. 
So, so with ABLE accounts, the federal law did um, have a provision that said that individual states had the option, they weren't mandated to do this, but they had the option to um, file a claim against a beneficiary's ABLE account after they passed away to essentially repay themselves for any medical that was spent um, through Medicaid services. Um, what is what is commonly known as the Medicaid clawback. And obviously this is something that has not been popular um, with people. It's been a real deterrent um, for folks opening accounts. You know, obviously you don't wanna be saving a lot of money in these accounts to simply have it be recouped by the state. Um, so one of the things that we did, and I think we're now one of five states um, that has been able to do this for our residents was to pass legislation that said that that um, in our in our state, Medi-Cal would not have the authority to file that claim against the beneficiary's able account once Cal able account once they've passed away. So we have essentially essentially eliminated uh, the Medicaid clawback here for our California residents. Now um, that protection does only apply to a California resident who has a Cal able account. So this is one of those considerations, you know, when you're looking at different plans, if, if you're using Medi-Cal, obviously I think this is a big one for a lot of folks. If, if you want to have that protection from recovery by Medi-Cal, you would want to participate in the CalABLE program. Um, and, and we passed some other legislation that was favorable to our program as well. Um, a bill passed that uh, exempted ABLE accounts from the enforcement of money judgments. And what that essentially means is that um, it protects your account uh, from being accessed by creditors. So creditors can't go after these accounts either. Okay. The next slide um, goes into, you know, I mentioned uh, federal tax reform last year. There were some changes to ABLE, again, favorable changes. The first one I've discussed already, able to work. Um, the second thing that they allowed now was a rollover from a 529 college savings account into an ABLE account. So particularly for those of us who opened um, 529 college savings accounts for our children um, who then later were diagnosed with a disability, um, now we have the ability to roll those funds over into an ABLE account. Um, the other thing that tax reform gave us was access to the savers credit. So this is a tax credit that um, historically has been um, something that uh, folks can, who are saving, retire, saving for retirement can access. So now, assuming you meet certain income limits, when you go to file taxes, you have uh, potentially the ability to take a tax credit of up to $2,000. And again, this is depending on your income. Um, there's a lot more information about the savers credit if you're interested in that. Um, you know, you can talk to a qualified tax advisor or we're happy to talk to you here in our office if you have more questions. Okay, the next question about the 529 rollovers. Yes. What is the limit to how much they can roll over per year? Great question. It is subject to that 15,000 contribution limit for the year. Um, so, so currently, yeah, you could roll over 15,000, you know, in this calendar year, but then you would have to wait until the next calendar year to roll over an additional, you know, it may be 16,000 for instance. Thank you. Yes. Okay, Cal Able fees. So here's a breakdown of our fees. Um, and I will describe these, and then in the next slide, I'll, I'll give people more of a, uh, a tangible example of what these fees translate to, because it can be a little bit convoluted. Uh, the first fee type that I mentioned was that account maintenance fee, the annual fee. This is something, again, all of, all of the programs have. Um, California's is $37 per year. Um, the second type of fee is going to depend on the investment option that you select. And um, currently we have four investment options. We have an FDIC insured option. So this is typical to your savings account option. Um, you won't be earning a lot of interest over time, but your principal um, is protected. So your money is there, your money is safe. That's the FDIC option. And there's no fees um, for enrolling in the FDIC option. 
Um, now we have three other investment options that are pretty straightforward. They, raise, they range from conservative to moderate to aggressive. And depending on which investment option you pick, then you are looking at what's called an underlying investment fee. And this is what we call an asset-based fee. So it's essentially a percentage of the assets that are in the account. Um, so with our uh, investment fees, you're looking at anywhere from zero, again, with the FDIC option, to 0.10% of whatever assets are in the account. And as I said, on the next slide, I'll actually break that down so we can have a, a better idea of what that translates to. The third fee type is what we call a state administrative fee. That's, again, a basis point fee. Um, we are collecting that fee because uh, this program was um, created with help from the uh, general fund. And so uh, we have to ask the legislature for money so far every year to be able to operate this program. And, and the state administrative fee goes toward helping us pay back those loans. Um, and then there's some other incidental fees that you'll that are typical of other programs. Um, paper statement fee. Most of us do things electronically now, but if you wanted to elect to have paper statements, you're looking at $10 per year. Um, insufficient funds, if you bounce a check, you're looking at a, a fee of $20. And then the check issuance fee, that was the fee uh, that I referenced earlier. If you're going to be sending out checks, then you are looking at an issuance fee of $5 per check. Again, just getting on the system is free, um, but there is that $25 minimum deposit to open your account. The next slide is that scenario, um, which kind of helps us get a better picture of, of what the fees cost. Um, so in this chart, we're assuming that the person has $3,000 in their Calable account. Um, so let's say that they elected for the FDIC insured option when they signed up. Their total fees for the year are $37 for the year. Um, there's no other fees. Uh, the state administrative fee does not apply, nor do underlying investment fees. Now, say that the person chose to invest in the moderate growth option, and they have, again, $3,000 in their account. Then you'll see at the bottom, total annual fees there. They're looking at about $53 per year. So as you can see, those fees will adjust, those total fees will adjust depending on how much money is in the account. So less than $3,000, obviously those fees are a lot lower, um, but you know, as, you, as you grow your assets, then the fees do go up. And this is where you know, I do want to make the point again that we need lots of enrollment in the program because the more participation we have, those fees will go down over time. Um, in the instance of our, of our sister program, our 529 College Savings Program, ScholarShare, um, their, their fees are virtually nothing now. Um, they've been up and going about 20 years. So there is the potential to really to really lower those fees over time. The next slide does uh, mention those investment options I just referenced. Um, all of our funds are managed by TIAA CREF. Um, they're our program manager and investment management company. They also manage our 529 college savings program here in California, and they've done that off and on for about 20 years. Um, they're terrific. Um, and again, there's the FDIC insured portfolio, conservative, moderate, and aggressive. If you want more information about the investment options, you can really um, dive into more detail about that. Um, you can look at prospectuses, you can look at account holdings. You can do that from our website, um, which, I'll, which I'll give you in a moment. But um, if you're interested in learning more about the investment piece, there is a lot more information on our website um, that will help you do that. Now you can change your investment options twice per year. So let's say you you started out in an aggressive option. Maybe you decided you know um, you're not hot for that anymore. You could you know switch to an FDIC option, um, or you could um, rearrange rearrange your investment spread. So if we look at the next slide, <clears throat> that is a screenshot. Um, of what you'll see when you're when you're electing your investment options. So in this scenario, we've actually we've actually spread out our investment. 
allocation. We've said, um, you know, rather than having 100% in either option, we've said, okay, I'm going to put 25% in my conservative portfolio, 25 in the moderate, 50 in the aggressive. But you could do a combination of different things. You could have 50% in one option and 50 in another. So you do have the ability to spread those out as you wish. And again, you can change that twice per year. So if we go to the next slide titled Ready to Open Your Account, this is a screenshot of what you'll see when you go to our website. Uh, the enrollment website address is calable.ca.gov. I do encourage folks once they get there to kind of click around, uh, read a little bit about the, um, the different areas. But then when you are finally ready to open an account, it's very straightforward. You'll see toward the bottom left, there's a gold button that says open an account. Um, you will simply, when you're ready, click that button and you're off to um, the enrollment process. The next screen shows you a screenshot that once you click that gold button, they will tell you here, you'll wanna have a couple of information, pieces of information handy to get your account going. Um, this is your typical social security number, birth dates, contact information. If the beneficiary is going to have an authorized legal representative, um, that person's social security number will be needed. They will verify that person's identity. And then again, any bank account information so that you can um, set up contributions um, or withdrawals. So account numbers, bank routing numbers. Uh, the next slide talks about if you need help with the enrollment process. As I said, it's pretty straightforward, but we have a great customer call center. Um, they're open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific. The phone number is there. The email address is there. Um, they, Even though our program is new, these folks have actually been servicing other ABLE plans in the country for the last three years. So they're very knowledgeable about um, about the process and they can really help you if you get stuck. They're very good about kind of walking you through the process. The next slide is titled ABLE National Resource Center and this is just a resource I like to give to everyone. Um, these folks are phenomenal. They are a, um, an arm of the National Disability Institute in DC. They're a nonprofit. Um, they were really active in all of the um, uh, lobbying that took place to, to make ABLE, the ABLE Act a reality. They're still very active today in um, you know, pursuing legislation that will improve ABLE programs. They have a ton of resources there. So anything and everything you wanted to know about ABLE, you go there, you'll find it. They literally have pages upon pages of webinars um, on very specific topics too. You know, some people want to know about general financial planning. How do they use a special needs trust with their ABLE account? Um, they just had one the other day that talks about strategies for funding your ABLE account. They have individual stories of people who talk about the different ways that they're using their account. Um, and they've also done a lot of program highlights. So if you go back, you'll actually see that other state plans have presented on their individual ABLE plan. Um, they also have a neat tool there. It's their state comparison tool, which allows you, if you're curious, to you know, pull up a couple of states and then it will have a drop down um, grid, which will show you how they compare. So what are the different fees? What are the different investment options? What are some of the different features? Um, some states may have benefits for their own residents, um, such as, as a tax deduction. That's something that we're actually trying to pursue here in California. There's about 10 plans that do offer a tax deduction um, to their uh, people who are contributing to the, um, to the plan. And so just kind of taking a look um, there will give you a wealth of information. And the next one is titled Legislative Priorities. I just touched on this. Um, something that we really would like to pursue for CalABLE is to see some sort of tax incentive, where, whether it's a tax deduction or a credit, for people who are contributing to um, CalABLE accounts. Um, there was a bill just recently introduced. I need to um, add the information here, but it's AB416, if anybody's interested. Um, it is a bill that would give um, contributors a tax deduction and it is making its way through the legislative process right now. We have a hearing coming up this Monday 
Um, and so if folks are interested in learning about that or how they could help us advocate for that, you're welcome to get in touch with me and I can help um, let you know how you can do that. The second priority we have right now is um, that we need to pursue tax conformity with federal law for those rollovers from a 529 college savings account to a Calable account. So uh, as I mentioned, with federal tax reform, they said, okay, you can now roll over from a 529 into an ABLE account, but that's, um, you know, if you were to do that today, you'd have no federal tax consequences for that, but because um, state tax law would need to conform to the federal tax law. If you were to do that today, you would see a, a bit of a tax consequence at the state level. And so um, there is a bill also, I believe it may have just been introduced, um, that, will, that will pursue that tax conformity so that if you are deciding to roll over from a college savings to CalABLE, you won't have any, you won't have any state, um, any tax consequences at the state or federal level. So again, you know, as, as this program is brand new and it's going to evolve over time, um, we wanna see it improve as much as possible, but we really need this, the help of stakeholders to help us do this. Um, you know, the legislation that we passed regarding um, elimination of the clawback, it was, it was crucial that we had, you know, we had a lot of folks come, come and testify for us, um, write a lot of support letters, and that was really the way we were able to get that done. So to, for those advocates out there who, who like this stuff and wanna help us advocate for these bills, um, please let us know. Um, and then help us spread the word, please, about, about CalABLE. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're a very small group out of Sacramento. We can't be everywhere, um, and there's a lot of, there's just a huge demand for information right now. Um, if you are associated with a group, we are willing to try to get there where we can. Um, we have a couple of different ways for having people collaborate with us. We have a couple of advisory councils. Um, and so if uh, you're associated with a, an advocacy group, a parent group, a nonprofit, um, service providers, you're more than welcome to explore joining our council. We try to meet a couple of times a year to discuss any issues related to ABLE, CalABLE. Um, and then something that we're rolling out shortly, it's, um, it's what we're referring to as our CalABLE ambassador program. And the thought here is that we will, um, you know, have some individuals who are using CalABLE, who are passionate about ABLE accounts, who can, who have networks of their own, who can help us with not just getting the word out about CalABLE, um, but also help us in getting feedback from our constituents. Again, we want to hear what's working for people, where they have concerns. Um, so where folks are willing to, this, this would be a volunteer type role um, where we'd have, you know, it's essentially a train the trainer. We would do kind of what I did here, which is to give you a lot of information about ABLE, how it works, how to enroll in CalABLE, and then we would send you out into your networks. Maybe you just want to post stuff on social media. Again, there's going to be no time commitment for this. It's really just how can you help us, um, and how can you help us get that feedback? And that is something that I'm spearheading. You'll see my contact information there, my email address, and my phone number. Uh, next page, Connect with CalABLE, talks about our social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter. We have some videos up on YouTube. Um, we do also have an email distribution list. So if you are interested in receiving our email program updates, you could sign up for that. And we'll kind of, you know, we send out items as, um, as they, they come up so that we can keep people posted about what's going on with legislation um, and with the program. And then the last slide just has our contact information here at the state treasurer's office. Um, in addition to the enrollment website that I mentioned before, the bottom link there is a link to our page that exists at the treasurer's website, the state treasurer's website. That website um, has a, more of our administrative information. So you'll find information there about our board meetings. Um, we have our fact sheets and all kinds of information there as well. Um, so that's another resource for you to check out. All right, Carrie, thank you so much. We have about a thousand questions. <laughs> that always happens. <laughs> we have run out of time, however. I do want to go back to uh, slide 20. There were a couple of people. Let me go back to it if I can figure out how. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm seeing my other stuff. You guys are seeing all my stuff. Hmm. Let's see. Shoot. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> um, okay, folks, I'm trying. While I get back to that, um, I want to, I'm going to give you a couple of questions to answer while I get back to that. Sure. Is the investment income shielded? And why are the interest rate rates so low? And who else is involved in Cal Able accounts as far as institutionalized settings? Hmm. Yeah. So, so the the program manager. Um, so the interest rates are going to change from month to month with regard to, for instance, the FDIC um, account. So all of our funds are managed by TIA CREF. T I A A CREF. Um, so they're the main institution that's, they're managing the program, um, they're the administrative record keeper, and they are the investment manager. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Uh, is the investments, the, you know, the actual nets? Oh, right. Yielded. It should not, yes. So, so as you are earning interest, it is not counted as income. Okay. No. All right. So here's page 20. Um, the questions about page 20, um, there were a couple of people who were confused a little bit that if they're not, whoops, wrong one. Uh, if you are opening an online account, do you get a number right away? Or is this some other account that you're going to use to transfer funds from? Um, and the other question about that is whose bank account, the parents, so mm -hmm. that money can be transferred. She, so a lot of people miss something here. So okay, no worries. Stop this one. Yeah, I think I know what people. Yeah, because sometimes there's. Um, so so the Cal Able account is is its own account. Now, when I say you'll want bank account information, what I'm saying is that. Um, so as an example, I am currently contributing automatically, you know, fifty dollars a month into my son's Able account. So when I signed him up, I went in and I, I set up a, a recurring contribution that links my personal bank account information. So what that does now is it pulls, you know, on the first of every month, it pulls $50 from my, my checking account into his ABLE account. So that's where the syncing of the, the accounts come in. But it doesn't ha always have to be the same account. So for instance, you could do a one-time contribution um, and you could link a different bank account. That would be fine as well. Um, so it doesn't have to be a bank account that's in the beneficiary's name necessarily, if that's answering the question. Thank you. Let me go to the next question. Are there other people that can be beneficiaries of this account? Um, I'm, I'm guessing it is upon death of the person whose the mm. name it is under. Yeah, good question. So with ABLE accounts, you don't have the ability to name a successor beneficiary. And that is because, you know, they want to ensure that the person, um, whoever the new beneficiary would be, would be a qualified individual. So, so what, um, if, what happens if the person passes away unexpectedly and they have right. $10,000 in their account? Right. So what would happen? Um, a couple things. Um, what they say is that you could continue to use the funds for any unpaid qualified disability expenses. Um, that also includes funeral and burial costs. Now, if the beneficiary has a sibling who um, has an ABLE account or meets the criteria for an ABLE account, you could transfer the, the funds to them without penalty, but it's only in the case of a sibling. So it's it's sort of a weird thing that's in the law. Now, you know, pending neither of those situations, um, basically, if the person had a will in place, then, you know, the funds would be distributed according to however, you know, they were specified in the will, you know, along with other assets. But the thing that you'd want to keep in mind is that um, you'd likely be seeing some sort of a tax penalty at that point. Um, okay. if, there, if there's no will, then the account's going to fall to the estate and and be subject to you know it's going to be processed according to to state a state law which is you know next of kin or um that sort of thing okay thank you um yeah. you mentioned going to the movies and taking your friends as a 
using their card. Is that a qualified disability expense? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And what about um, we, travel? Yeah. Travel is definitely one as well. Um, people often ask about vacations, and we say that's absolutely a qualified disability expense um, where, you know, as long as, as the funds are being spent for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So, for instance, um, you could pay for their transportation and other things out of the ABLE funds, but you wouldn't be able to buy tickets for, you know, other family members or that sort of thing. But absolutely, it is a qualified disability expense. Awesome. Can the investments be split in the account? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I, I think I had that, I, I showed that one slide, it was sort of a screenshot um, um, where as you're making contributions, you can elect to spread out your investments. Okay. Another person asked if you can use Zelle, PayPal, or Venmo to adjo uh, avoid check fees. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a new one. Okay. We'll let you get back to us on that. Yeah, we'll have to get back to you. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to the what new one. Other, there's always a new one that comes up every time. Yep. Exactly. A lot of people were asking, how long does it take to roll over their accounts from other states? And uh -huh. is it possible when you do that, that your benefits are affected through SSI as, you know, unearned income? Right. No, they, it shouldn't be. And I actually went through this process myself because I did have an account in another state prior to um, opening with CalABLE. Uh, it took about a month. So the law gives you a 60-day window during which you can have that rollover process take place. But it, but it took me about a month in total. It, it probably depends on the plan that you're rolling out from. Well, what if you um, have $15,000 in it? Is that going to make a difference? Um. I don't think that it would. Okay. No, I don't think that it should. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, and what is the process to do that? How would you get started with that? With a rollover? Uh -huh. Yes. So you need to initiate the process by first establishing the CalABLE account. So you'll go in, you will set up the account, and then it will ask you um, how you're planning to fund your initial contribution. And one of those options is a rollover. Okay. And so when you click rollover, it'll walk you through the process. Basically, you'll have a, a form that you'll want to download and uh, print out, fill out. You send that form into CalABLE. At the same time, though, you'll want to get in touch with the existing plan and let them know that you're doing the rollover and find out if they have any steps that you'll need to take on their end. Um, those have kind of varied from state to state as we're finding out as well. So you'll you'll open the Calable account, start the rollover process, but then you'll also want to be in touch with your with your current uh, plan. Another question about moving, and this is moving the physical person. What if you move out of California or you move out of the country? Yeah. So you could definitely just keep your Calable account. Um, doesn't matter if you're residing here or not. But I'm guessing um, you don't have the same yeah. benefits you get as a California resident. So, right. So, for instance, um, all of the same benefits with the, the exception of that protection from the Medicaid clawback. And the reason is, you know, say you move to Ohio, for instance, um, and you have the CalABLE account. Um, Ohio, unless they've passed, you know, similar legislation, um, their, you know, their state Medicaid, their equivalent of Medi-Cal could file that claim against the, there, were, there would be nothing prohibiting them um, from, from filing a claim against the CalABLE account. So the law that we have is specific to a California resident with a CalABLE account, but all of the other benefits would, would be intact, yeah. Thank you. One person um, works with several clients and who have micro enterprises. Can it be used for the working capital for those individuals with micro enterprises? Oh, I'd have to look into that. That's that's a new one for me. So whoever asked that, you're going to need to call Carrie, and now you have her number. Yeah. Um, do conservatorships need to be adjusted to be able to manage this account as part of the estate? Right. That's a good question. Um, so. What we've learned in doing this, and I know a lot of our listeners are probably already familiar with the fact that in California, there's conservators of the person and conservators of the estate. Um, because this is a financial program, 
Um, the assumption we're working under is that more than likely the conservator would need to be a conservator of the estate, which is prohibitive because it's costly. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so a sticking point with that is that right now, um, you know, as I mentioned, that that definition of an authorized legal representative is something that's in the federal law. So for us to expand, um, you know, the definition of an authorized legal representative at the state level, there's there's questions about um, whether we could do that. Um, folks who who want to talk to me about this more, I can actually I have I have the exact language I can share that talks about conservatorships. Um, it, it technically should be somebody who has control over the person's financial affairs. So it's something that we plan to continue to discuss with attorneys and stakeholders. Um, we know it's an issue. We know it's potentially pro prohibitive for some people. So realize it's an issue and um, we don't have any plans to try to expand the definition right now. But again, we'll, we'll continue to talk about it. Okay. I would... Um... I just want to acknowledge that we're way beyond our time, but I think all your questions are valuable. So Carrie, if you have time for a couple of more. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that any representative can help someone open account. The person, if they're not able to do this without supports, the parent, conservator, maybe a sibling can help right. them open this account. Is that correct? That's correct. That's absolutely correct. The thing you need to be careful about is that legally, whoever is transacting on the account needs to be that authorized legal representative. So pe when you're making withdrawals, making contributions, accessing, um, you know, it, it really needs to be that authorized legal representative. Okay. And then can special needs trust funds be transferred to a CalABLE account? Yep, absolutely. And in fact, um, one of the ways we're seeing this used, um, a lot of people are familiar with the fact that, for instance, when you have a trust and you're, you're paying housing expenses out of a trust, um, people are often taking a, a, um, a hit to their in-kind resources. Um, so because housing is a qualified expense under ABLE, what we see a lot of people doing is, is funneling money from the special needs trust to the ABLE account and then paying those housing expenses out of the ABLE account. Now, something I didn't mention, just because I'm thinking of it right now, um, there is one caveat to housing expenses, such as rent. Um, the law does say that if you are withdrawing funds for a housing expense, um, that you need to have that money spent within the same calendar month. Otherwise, Social Security will start to count it as a resource. So it's just something to keep in mind with regard to paying rent and housing. If you're if you're going to do that, you know, you take the money out on the second, you'll want to have that money spent by the end of the month okay. so that it won't be counted as a resource by Social Security. Right. Um, one person is asking, her son has a job. Uh, can he put all $10,000 of his annual earnings into the account? He sure could. Okay. No. SSI impact? Well, you know, whatever, whatever, again, whatever formulas they are going to, when they're looking at income, mm -hmm. um, whatever they're going to apply, they're still going to do that. Okay, so it's still um, 50 cents on the dollar gets deducted. That's right. Okay, great. But the money can then absolutely go into the ABLE account, yes. Great, all right. And if the person who is managing the account for an individual is a parent who is also the conservator. Do they need to get powers for the estate? No. Um, no. Mm -mm. And, and in fact, just to clarify, um, the law does not specify a parent. It needs to be a parent of a minor child. It is a parent. Okay. Is, is what we have in the law. Okay. Oh, that's good. Great. Mm -hmm. And so you can open this account at any age for an individual. Is that correct? Absolutely. At the, as long as, yeah. Yep. As long as their disability began before 26, it can be at any age. Okay. Um, can debit withdrawal have limits just like you can with an SSI bank card? We're still learning the policies around our debit card. I don't think there will be limits. Um, there may be a card cost, which I, I'm hearing, um, you know, I don't have it exactly right now, about a dollar a month if you're going to elect to have the prepaid card. Okay. Um, but yeah. 
And then I have um, one last question, and then I have a few people with their hands up who are on the phone or don't know how to send in a question. Um, okay. So I'm going to ask you the last question. HUD seems pretty uninformed about how ABLE accounts are managed. Do you have any sense of how people can work with HUD, um, the housing you know, development program, Section mm -hmm. 8, low-income housing, in order to you know, make sure that they understand that this money is available to help them pay rent? And then I'm right. going to let um, the first person with their hand raised ask the next. <laughs> No worries. Thank you for asking about HUD. Um, HUD has been a sticking point for not just CalABLE, but for ABLE plans across the country. Um, and that is because we, um, to date, we've been working on this a few years, we still do not have federal guidance from HUD on their treatment of ABLE accounts. Um, you know, people around the country, all of the state treasury offices, national disability groups have been writing letters upon letters to HUD. We've been on the Hill. We've been telling them, you know, this is a real obstacle to people having comfort around opening accounts. And we are hearing rumblings that I'm, I'm not holding my breath, but that in the coming weeks, we may finally have that guidance. Um, but what, what, what what's happening, obviously, is because, you know, people who are working on the ground determining eligibility um, because they haven't received guidance from HUD, in many cases, they don't know anything about ABLE. Um, there have been a, a handful of instances that we're aware of where folks who, for instance, had an account in another state did get disqualified for their low-income housing. And so in those instances, we, you know, we offered to reach out to the people they were liaising with. Um, we have shared, um, we often will share the federal law and the federal regs around it, which specifically says that these accounts cannot be counted when you're determining eligibility for a means-tested program. And so while, you know, it's going to be an ongoing education effort, even when we get this guidance, um, just getting these folks up to speed, we're literally kind of educating these offices, you know, one at a time. And so if, if people are encountering encounter, encountering um, difficulties when, when working with people with HUD, with Section 8, um, get in touch with us because we're trying to document these issues and we're also willing, like I said, to get on a phone call, to send them documentation, to arm people with documentation, just so that we can start letting these, these people know um, that they, they really can't be counting these accounts when they're, when they're looking at, at eligibility. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Bart. I have unmuted everyone, but I think you've muted yourself. So if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself. If you can figure out how to do that. There you go. Go ahead Am and I ask here? a question. Bart, you're on. Okay. Uh, my question, I think you were able to answer. My son is conserved. He'll never be able to manage his own money. And uh, so we as his conservators, his, his mom and I, uh, we make the decisions uh, and manage the activity of the account. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Now, my other question with that with that would be, um, if we were to fund his, because he, again, he'll have no income, but we would try and begin to fund uh, his ABLE account, um, if we were to do it from money that we paid taxes on, and at his passing, it was the to pass on, would they, and that's subject to taxes again, isn't that double taxation? How does that dealt with? Um, so all of the contributions are always post tax. Um, so you're talking about, you know, any kind of tax penalty that would be incurred post post death? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's specific to the fact that, you know, the tax advantage piece comes in when money is spent for a qualified disability expense. Okay. So anytime, so anytime the money's coming out, which it can, but it's not going toward, you know, if it's no longer going toward a qualified disability expense, it, it's, it loses that tax advantage treatment. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. We're going to go to Carol next. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Carol, we can hear you if you talk. Yes. What if uh, the, the, person that you're funding doesn't have a permanent address but only a PO box. 
Um, I haven't had that question before, and I would have to go into the system to look. I think it should be fine. fine. But um, again, I'm, I'm happy to check into it. All right, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you for checking. Of course. Rosa Felix, we're listening. Rosa? Okay, let's go to Gabby. Gabby, do you have a question? Hua, do you have a question? Hua? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Hi, who's there? Uh, this is Julia. I have a question. All right, go ahead. Um, Gary, did you say that um, if you're a parent or a legal representative, you can open the account, or does the parent, after the child turns 18, have to be the legal representative? Nope, well. just, just being the parent will suffice. Okay, because we are conservative, the conservator of the person, but we're not conservator of the estate. And so right. I can still open the account for him as long as I'm just the parent. That's right. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're never just the parent. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. I never. <laughs> All right, welcome. Gabby, are you ready to ask your question? Nope. Wa? <laughs> and Brittany? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So you talked about sealing lifetime sealings of the funds. So does that mean if a, let's say a person had the 529,000 in there but they spent 29,000, could they add another 29,000 or how does that work? Um so you can build back up but you will uh, you will be subject to that annual contribution cap that whatever it is at the time. Um currently $15,000. Okay, but and then you can always fill back up to the lifetime limit. Yes. Oh, great. And one more question was: you said something about um, their income being directly deposited into the account was still subject to the Social Security um, accounting for that money. So right. That, okay, so it still gets deducted then. That's right. Okay. All right. Well, um, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Oh, you already answered that one. Okay. And I haven't actually been with somebody who set up an account yet. And I, so I'm a little fuzzy on when you talk about the Cal Able account, that's something separate from their personal account that, the, that you transfer money from the Cal Able to their personal account. Is that how it goes? Right. So, so you're opening up a separate account with the Cal Able account, and then you're funding the Cal Able account with funds from, you know, whatever source it may be. It may be the beneficiary's own, you know, bank account. Um, okay, but, but you said about money going to the system and then getting, you know, having it uh, either write a check or whatever. So this other, or the account is um, you set up yourself, is that considered the system or I'm still fuzzy on that? Um, yeah, so so you go in online mm -hmm. and you, you literally, uh, you do it right there. So you're you're putting in the person's information and then you're at that point deciding, you, you have to make that initial contribution of, of $25. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll want to de decide on how you're going to fund it. So you could right then and there, you know, transfer money from a bank account you mm -hmm. could you could elect to send in a check as your first twenty five dollar payment, and so in that case you would you would check a box that says that you'll be mailing in your your payment, right? If that okay. makes sense. Yeah, I understand right? that. If you want to so, bring some points on your credit card, can you use a credit card? Oh yeah, uh, I don't think you can. Okay, just that idea. Yeah, I think it's ACH only. Yeah. Okay. All right, Ben has a question. Yes, um, I want to know uh, two questions actually. 
for the annual contribution, is the calendar year or the one year period? It's the calendar year. Okay. Um, yeah. So the second question is, when do we expect uh, to pass the bill AB416? Do you have a timeline? Uh, we hope it passes. <laughs> we actually introduced similar legislation last year and it did not pass, which is why we really are hoping that people will help us advocate. Um, like I said, it's just now starting its way through the process. Uh, the first hearing has been scheduled for Monday and we do have some stakeholders that are coming to testify at the Capitol. So if you're interested in following that progress, um, you can check in with us or you could you could go online and, and track the bill online. Okay. So if it got passed this year, we we could get tax deductible for this year's contribution, right? I'm not sure when it, it would probably it would probably become effective the following uh, year, um, but yeah, it would essentially allow um, people who are contributing to take that tax deduction. Okay. Thank you. And Wa, do you still have a question? Last chance. Wa Gao. Well, I can't hear, so we're going to have to wrap it up because we're done. And <laughs> Harry, thank you so much for giving us your time, going over the time and answering all the questions. We don't have any questions left. I hope I didn't miss anybody's question, but if I did, now you have Carrie's contact information and email and feel free to contact her directly. If you need the handouts for this, um, you will find them on our website probably by next week, along with uh, the recording of this presentation. So I will share this link with all of you um, who attended today, and I will try to email if it allows me to the handouts from today. So those of you who weren't able to find them to download will have them as well. And I can't tell you, you know, probably 70 to 80% of the people have stayed on with us the whole time. So I saw that, that's amazing. It tells you just how important this information really is. It really so, is. Thank you for being such a fantastic facilitator and bearing with me on the technical so stuff. <laughs> we're happy to help and we're grateful for your support. Brittany came back in. Brittany, can we try and see if we can hear you now? Oh, sorry. Uh, I You might have an answered all my questions now, but I do thank you very much for the information you gave us all. Of thank course. You. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Have a great week. You, you too. too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.